My name is Michael Hommel. I'm head at, of the molecular diagnostics at the Charité in the wonderful city of Berlin. And I would like to guide you through uh, this presentation dealing with next generation sequencing and new developments uh, for this um, application. Now, the disclaimer. So, sequencing is not a new technology. It already started 1977 when Maxim and Gilbert reported a new method for sequencing of DNA. But nobody is using Maxim Gilbert because there was a second technology published in the same year from Sanger and Coulson which was much more successful because it was easier to handle in the lab and to generate a sequencing. So that is also the reason why the number of publication, publications using the Maxim and Gilbert approach, which is time-consuming and which is uh, lab-consuming technology, disappeared almost completely from the scenery. And the Sanger sequencing was established. Initially, it was a radioactive labeled system, which was later on replaced by fluorescence labeled dyes. And we are all were all happy with this technology for many, many years. And it also was a, the basis for the KRAS testing in colorectal cancer a couple of years ago when there was an approval of the FDA for anti-EGFR receptor antibodies for colorectal cancer because there's in many cases an overexpression on the protein level of these molecules. But what was ignored at that time that the overexpression of the EGF receptor is not sufficient. What we need in addition is information about the mutational status of the RAS molecule. If RAS is mutated, then this molecule is able to initiate signaling into the nuclei and to initiate cell growth. So even with the anti-HFR antibodies, in the case of uh, mutated KRAS, there was no successful treatment. And uh, it took some time uh, until this this testing was uh, established in the guidelines for uh, treating colorectal cancer. And as you can see here from our lab, it's a nice representation of Sanger sequencing with the fluorescent dyes and the detection of Keras mutation. In this case, the patient will not benefit from the treatment. Continue. Now, a few years later, now we are in the year 2020, there was a lot of development over the last years. And we have a number of already established biomarkers and much more are under evaluation. And even the term biomarker received some addition. So we initially talked about the KRAS mutation. This is the green labeled alteration. But in addition, we have now amplification, we have translocation, we have RNA expression, we have the protein expression, we have some other alterations, I come to this a little bit later, and even non-human DNA. All these categories can be regarded as biomarkers. And if we try to translate this um, into the cancer types, and the most prominent one at the moment is the uh, non-small cell lung cancer, you can see it's quite colorful. We have a number of different alterations in, in this disease and also different categories ranging from immunohistochemistry to translocation, generating uh, fusion genes, and of course, mutations. But lung cancer is not alone. We have the gut cancer, and we have many, many other cancers around the body which carry different types of alterations which are quite, uh, to some extent, cancer-specific, but also uh, there's a, some degree of overlap 
across the different cancer types, but with sometimes different functionality. And even breast cancer, you can see the only red labeled um, um, category here, the gene expression. There is a gene expression which um, is very typical for breast cancer and helps uh, the, the understanding of this disease more, much better. So you see in this scheme a broad variety of different alterations in different types of cancers which are highly interesting uh, for the biology of these diseases. And it's now also time for pan cancer uh, alterations. Uh, it's the anthrac alteration. It's the mutational burden. It's, of course, very classical, the morphology and the microsatellite satellite instability. So these can be found in many of these different cancer types. And if we just jump to the molecular drivers in the non-small cell lung cancer field, you can see there's a, a huge number of different drivers in this disease, and the majority is still unknown. And if you have a very careful look into the categories here, you see a very small frequency of this um, driver mutations in this uh, disease, and it's more to be detected in the future. And if you translate this into histology on the right-hand side, you can also see that the non-small cell lung cancer is not only adenocarcinoma of the lung, but it's also squamous cell carcinoma and some other types. So it's broader than usually uh, thought in, in, the di in the discussions. And um, the frequency, uh, once again, now is, uh, in, in the perspective of different types of, of cancers, you can uh, easily identify, once again, the non-small cell lung cancer as the most prominent category of cancers. But there is an emerging um, development at the moment that also other types of cancers are becoming more and more interesting in terms of molecular alteration and molecular subtyping uh, of uh, these diseases. What do we need to cover those um, broad molecular range of markers? Um, then we are in the f very quick in the field of next generation sequencing because Singer sequencing, although this is a very nice technology, is not capable enough to um, detect multiple different alterations in, in one assay. And here, for example, the Oncomine Precision Assay is a tool which covers most or almost all of the uh, relevant alterations in different types of cancers. So 50 genes have been com compiled in this uh, assay covering almost 3,000 unique alterations consisting of mutations, copy number variations, and fusion events, and most uh, logical, uh, the non-small cell lung cancer is very well represented here in the Oncomine precision assay. And here you can see that uh, this assay also respects uh, genes which uh, are already labeled or in guidelines or even in, in the use of clinical trials. So you are able with this precision assay uh, to answer a lot of relevant uh, questions. A very emotionally discussed field in, in oncology in the last years, at least two and three last years, is the detection of fusion events causing fusion transcripts which are nice targets for sequencing. However, it's sometimes a bit tricky if you, if you have translocations and fusion transcripts where you know the driver gene, but not the fusion partner. That always raises some technical concerns, how to, to cover this uh, need to detect a fusion event on the RNA level 
without knowing the fusion partner. And this was uh, done in the Oncomine um, position assay in different ways. So it's quite easy for the known fusions where you know the driver and the partner gene. Then you can generate a system for amplification of this region, which is highly sensitive and very reliable. This is also the case if the, the, the sequence in between the driver and the partner is not known. You can also identify quite easily um, a system, an amplification system, which is able to sensitive to have a sensitive um, amplification of this region, uh, which is then very helpful for uh, sensitive detection. It's more difficult and more tricky if the partner is unknown. Then you have only the driver situation, and then you need to have some bioinformatics um, tools for the interpretation of the sequencing data. These are RNA-derived data in order to identified to identify an imbalance situation and uh, there was much um, let's say advance in the last one or two year, years one or two years in order to optimize these type of imbalance exon tiling system and the oncomine position assay is a very well advanced system in this respect but even the best gene panel for mutation detection or amplification of fusions, what we need in addition is a technology able to produce NGS data in a high throughput, a throughput system, a very rapid time frame and very reliable. The preparation of the libraries used for uh, next generation sequencing is to some extent quite uh, cumbersome and lab intensive and of course there's a high need based on uh, a growing number of samples to do it uh, very rapidly and with the support of automated system and here we have um, a nice new development which is the, uh, the ion torrent nexus system it's fully automated. You can run it in one day and without much user intervention. So there's only a few hands-on time needed in order to run the entire system. So you start with the DNA or RNA and uh, the rest will be done by the machine, including sample purification, library prep, of course, the sequencing and uh, the uh, reporting of the data. So this system, this GeneXus system, uh, provides the user with a high degree of flexibility. So we can run different assays in parallel. We have multiplexing capability up to 32 libraries in a single run. Um, we have a very nice feature, which is the um, um, the use of the reagents for up to, to two weeks in the instrument, which is, I think, technicians will like it. Um, we have um, a, a, a very nice colorful strips, so avoiding errors and mistakes in placing the reagents into the machine. And um, we have a quite small footprint for such a uh, yeah, comprehensive machine in the lab, so we can really be quite um, restricted with, with the storage space we need. And in addition, which will come very soon, is a nucleic acid purification and quantification system. So even that will be added to the GeneXus system to complete the entire workflow in a very, very elegant way. Of course, we are very interested, not only we in Berlin, but many uh, sites across the globe, how this system is really working, because it sounds very fantastic to have a system which allows you to 
put in the DNA and then go away and let the machine work. So there was a decision for a multi-center study for evaluation of the GeneXus system and the Oncomine Precision Assay. And this was done in Portugal, in Porto, in Switzerland, in Basel, at the Charité in Berlin, in Germany, and in Naples, in Italy. So we have four centers, uh, joint forces, in order to, uh, to test uh, the uh, GeneXus system in combination with the Oncomine Precision Assay. We selected um, from the each cust customer side own samples, which have been pre-characterized by other technologies or assays. Um, so we cannot really compare uh, b across the sites uh, the results, but uh, we have, of course, the, uh, the pre-characterization of these samples. And um, we have done FFPE samples. We have analyzed uh, liquid biopsies. Um, so the variant types, the mutations, the copy numbers, and the fusions. So quite broad um, approach uh, for testing the GeneXus system and the Oncommon precision assay. Let's start with the mutation analysis. As you can see here, we have included a number of different uh, cancer types, altogether 45 samples, uh, including some reference material, which you can see under the term unknown. I think uh, what is also very important in the daily life is uh, the knowledge regarding the tumor cellularity of each of the samples, because uh, low tumor cellularity might prevent detection of important alterations. So that is always a challenge if it comes uh, to very low uh, tumor cellularity. That is the overview. That was our starting point. And then, first of all, we uh, checked for the representation of well-known alterations. You see here uh, different types of EGFR mutations, PIX3CA mutation, Karas mutations, and uh, the two mutations. And you can see there's a coverage, uh, at least in this uh, set of samples, which is quite uh, convincing. And what is also a nice comparison is the allelic frequency. I mentioned in the previous slides that we also included samples with a low uh, tumor cellularity. And this is also reflected here. You can see different alterations uh, which uh, are covered by this assay and a broad, really broad range of allelic frequencies. That is not only the tumor cell content, as you surely know, we have in many, many of these cancer types also tumor heterogeneity, which causes then low allelic frequencies. And of course, uh, the most, or one of the most important parts of the study is the comparison with the already existing data. These have been uh, done with the focus assay or oncomine focus assay, the solid tumor oncomine assay, uh, AmpliSec colon and lung version 2 panel, and from a different vendor, the TrueSight 170. And um, on the right hand side, you see a very nice correlation of the pre existing uh, data with those generated with the OPA and the GeneXus system. And um, this uh, Comparison is summarized also in the, the small table. You see a 100% specificity and a concordance with is 100% or a little bit below 100%, which is very usual if it comes to the comparison of different technologies. Uh, next, only a few numbers of cases with copy number alterations because we restricted our comparison to already known uh, alterations. And you can see here that uh, this assay uh, is also able to detect copy number, copy number variations, which is usually quite easy if you have a high copy number uh, um, amplification. But uh, it's more tricky, especially in combination with tumor, low tumor cell content, uh, if there is a low copy uh, number amplification. But this is 
done very nicely here with the OPA assay. You can see uh, the comparison here with these uh, type of amplifications. Of very high interest uh, is the detection of fusion gene events um, based on the RNA level. You can once again see here that the tumor samples used for, for this assay is altogether 29 samples. Once again, the lung cancer is the most prominent one. Uh, the, again, important in additional information is the distribution of the tumor cellularity, and this goes down uh, um, to, a, to a range between 10 and 30 percent. Um, the detection of fusion variants is represented here. You can see uh, here a number of different uh, fusion events, including the anthrax and the ALK, and some others uh, with the um, known fusion partners. In addition, you can see here the MET exon 14 skipping event also dete detected on the RNA level. Um, once again, the summary of these uh, fusion events, you can see we included cases where, which were characterized by a variety of different assays, in, including the RJDX assay, uh, the TrueSight 170, and uh, of course the very traditional method, the FISH uh, um, assay. And again, the specificity is extremely high, 100%, but also the concordance to already existing data is uh, of really, really impressive uh, high value. For the unknown fusion partners, uh, I already mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, there was the development of a new bioinformatics algorithm in order to identify those unbalanced uh, situation on the RNA. Here you can see some very nice examples how the detection of fusion genes works. In the upper level, you can see the targeted isoform detect detection, and this was done for three different samples, and you should realize that especially the NTRAC1 and the RED um, samples have a very low tumor content, so you can see only a limited number of reads, whereas the anthrax refusion was very, in a tumor sample, with a very high tumor load. So that is uh, the usual way it, it goes, but in the lower level you can also see the imbalance detection, which is nicely demonstrating uh, that um, there is sufficient information available to identify not only the imbalance, but also the location of the break in the gene, identifying the remaining kinase functionality, which is important for as a, as a, as a target for further analysis. So this approach allows you also in the case of unknown fusion partners to do a reliable detection of the fusion gene situation. And finally, also becoming more and more important are the liquid biopsies. You can see here from the numbers um, that we included 12 samples. Most of them have been um, derived from uh, non-small cell lung cancer samples. Interestingly, in also our experience, it is not always possible uh, to uh, extract the recommended 20 nanograms of circulating uh, tumor DNA. Uh, in this case, in our uh, case collection of 12 samples, in some cases we were very low in the in the number in the in the concentration and the amount of uh, circulating tumor DNA. But let's see what comes out. You can see here that um, the distribution of the uh, of these alterations in the in the in the plasma samples and the liquid biopsies, most of them not unexpected, are EGFR uh, mutations, including the T790M mutation. Of course, you will find uh, Karas and P53 mutation and uh, some others. And as you can see, even in those 
cases with the very low uh, amount of uh, circulating tumor DNA, the detection was really successful. And finally, you can see here again the concordance uh, with the pre-existing data, specificity 100% uh, for all the alterations, and almost 100% concordancy for, uh, also for all the alterations. And uh, this is also illustrated in the graph on the, on the right-hand side, where you see a very high correlation, uh, uh, correlation with the pre-existing data. So if we come to an overall summary and uh, conclusion of, of the data, you can see here that uh, the system, the Genexus in com combination with the Oncomine precision assay, is a very specific uh, system. And also compared with a variety of different technology, we were able with a high concordance and a high sensitivity, um, different types of alterations in formal and fixed uh, tissue samples, but also in liquid biopsies in the circulating DNA uh, present in the plasma. So that is a very impressive result. And uh, this was not from one single site. These are the data from four different uh, sites across Europe. And I think this highlights uh, to a very high degree the reliability of that approach. And let me conclude at the end. Um, I think um, this increase of alterations is really demanding and it's becoming progressively dis demanding in the future. So we have the challenge to cover these uh, demands of, of, the, of, the, of the entire system. We need to be flexible in order to cover the diagnostic needs. We need to minimize the workload because uh, technicians and scientists are quite expensive and we have to save their um, working hours uh, to do the data interpretation and not only the lab work. So automation is very welcome. And um, I think that the Genexus has a really great potential for as a future solution to combine all steps of diagnostic uh, next generation sequencing. And what we have seen in this study across different sites, the data are very robust and reliable, which provides an excellent basis also for the introduction in uh, many more labs. Finally, I want to acknowledge uh, the very excellent cooperation with the colleagues at the different sites. Also very nice communication and cooperation with the colleagues from Thermo Fisher Scientific and of course from my team, that is Burkhardt and Carsten, who really supported uh, this work uh, to a very, very broad extent. And thank you very much for your attention.